everyone, and welcome to our Catalyst Spotlight. We have with us today Katie Lock O'Brien, who's been a very busy lady the past few years. She is a multi-episode director of AP Bio, Keenan, Perfect Harmony, as well as Saved by the Bell reboot. And she is just about to leave to do CBS's upcoming comedy, several episodes of Ghosts. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> they know it's a busy time. You're leaving tomorrow. We can tell everyone I, you're giving us your time, but you're leaving I fly to tomorrow. Montreal first thing in the morning, I think 5 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> that is incredible. I'm so impressed. Uh, we won't take up too much of your time, but thank you again no, for being fine. here. How did you land your very first TV gig? Great question. Um, I My very first TV directing gig came through NBC's Female Forward program. I was in the inaugural class of that program, which uh, was 2017 to 2018. And so they chose, you know, 10 of us for that. The way I got into that program and sort of had the materials to, to you know, show to showrunners to get hired for that gig um, is that I you know, for three or four years, just was on the side making a ton of short films, uh, web series, you know, I was directing pilot presentations, kind of anything I could do uh, on the side, things that I could self-produce. And so when it came time to apply to that program, even though there were also plenty of women applying who had, you know, done features that had gone to Sundance or like multi-million dollar commercial work or whatever, I submitted my little short films side by side, but there was something about the package and they could, you know, see my voice clearly and, and all that stuff. And, um, you know, budget and production value didn't matter. The, the content was there. And so I, I got uh, hired to do an episode in season two of AP Bio. And that was my first one. And the guest star was Christopher Lloyd. And it was a magical <laughs> time. It's, it's a 1980s dream come true. Is it was. It 80s, 90s. Uh, whatever my child it I mean, was straight out of my childhood I was like yeah he was there the whole time he was there the whole time <laughs> taxi <laughs> back to the future was everything yeah. yeah I mean he had a career before we knew him in back to the future he, before Doc Brown he was still amazing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. of course that is wonderful <laughs> and so what would you say were your biggest takeaways from that program at NBC it was uh, that first episode was such a helpful experience and uh, so much credit goes to how unbelievably supportive the people in that department at NBC were and are um, because, you know, they absolutely had our back. They armed us with lots of workshops ahead of time that were done in such a respectful way where it was, you know, they were like, we know that you all already know what you're doing. And so here are a ton of workshops that are specific to the context of episodic directing, which is its own animal. And mm -hmm. even if you are amazing at shot listing and working with actors and all of the sort of core competencies, there are still things that are unique about how do you work with a showrunner? What's it gonna be like with your editor when you're shadowing on a show before you get ready to direct it? What does it mean to be a good shadow? And so they sort of gave us a lot of that and then from the episode itself, you know, I think maybe this is just me, but I think it's true for a lot of new directors, a lot of young directors, a lot of uh, especially female directors um, that like you just go in with such imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Apologies about that dog barking. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot the dog's of chaos. been through it too. There's so there's much chaos lot. going on in my house outside of this blank white wall, which seems pristine. It's very funny. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, you go, I at least, I still to this day go in with a ton of imposter syndrome. I'm just like, I don't know why I'm here. I think it was an accident that they hired me, but like, I'll do my best, right? And um, I'm sure I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sure I'll run into something that is like too hard for me. And luckily, you know, knock on wood, it hasn't happened yet. But um, going through that process, working with actors and then getting feedback, uh, you know, having watched some other directors work at that point, what I took away was you know, while there are sort of general things at which you have to be proficient, everyone does this job in a different way. Mm -hmm. And whatever your way of approaching it is, is okay, right? right? And so the way that I plan, the way that I give notes, the way, all of those things, I didn't know if that was going to be the same as or on par with other directors, but like my method was right for me mm -hmm. and the episode was a success. And so I think that was actually a huge takeaway because whatever I had been convincing myself would not be up to snuff or whatever mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't the case. And and it was such a lovely collaboration and and I just fell in love. 
I love that. I love that. And it, it seems important to note, and I, this kind of leads us into our next question. I've heard it described before that being a director for television is almost like being the host of a party where you don't know anyone, but you are the yeah. host. And it's like, here's the party, you're in charge. And you're like, okay, a lot different. So can you talk to us about that, about how directing television is different from film? It's a very bizarre experience, but one that I really enjoy for what it's worth. Um, yeah, I mean, you're coming in and you're saying, hey, 200 people who've been working together for months already and know this show inside and out. Um, I don't know this show all that well, and I'm your boss now, I guess. And so that is a very weird thing. Um, I think so much of what solves that for me is happens during prep, actually, mm -hmm. and way before you get to set, because if I have developed a great rapport with the showrunner by that point, I mean, you're there to serve the showrunner. Right. right. And so ultimately, it's this balance of not being afraid to pitch your own ideas and fight for certain things, but also knowing like you don't know this show as well as that person does. Right. And so, you know, the best you can do is mine every little chance that you get their attention to to make sure that you understand the tone and the world of this show inside and out as, right. as much as you can. And if I've developed that relationship, if I spend a lot of time in prep, probably more than a lot of directors do, um, really working with every department down to the nitty gritty. But that mm -hmm. also, I think, trickles down. And what happens is if I have a great relationship with the production designer and, and props and, and wardrobe and everything before my episode has started, that trickles down to their onset people. Mm -hmm. And so there's already a little bit of a relationship there, too. And it's like a warmer welcome. And you know, uh, and then your AD is your biggest ally. And so you sort of like start just making those friendships bit by bit and you have a little bit more leeway and time in prep to do that stuff so that you've got some people on your side already. Right. And then, you know, by association, then if that if those people are on your team, it's easier to get the rest of the people on your team. And and then the actors, of course, it's it's it just becomes a skill to get very quick on day one at figuring out how different actors like to hear their notes. Oh, yeah. And if you can figure out each person's actor speak as quickly as possible, you know, then you're kind of good to go. So I, I actually enjoy the challenge of that. Um, I also like sort of being newer to this job and, you know, for what it's worth having like a squeaky voice and blonde hair because they show up and <laughs> I think often get people are like, okay, we'll see if this lady knows what she's doing. And then yeah. I, and then it's fun to me to sort of like have a great big successful first day and then, be, you know, course. everybody's really fired up. So, well, this, <laughs> this tiny blonde with the squeak of voice also went to Harvard, ladies and gentlemen. So please, I always love to say that in regard to, I don't, I don't lead, that, so it's I like don't lead that with it, but, but you can surprise them. And then they're like, Oh, okay. Understood. <laughs> she, you know, she knows what's yeah. happening. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have since directed multiple episodes, even multiple seasons of shows for NBC and Peacock. Why do you think that is? Ooh, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, so yes, being a successful director is about putting something great on screen, but particularly in TV directing, where the hours are grueling and people are there for many months in a row and directors are coming in and out, um, it's equally important to service the other aspects of that, which are giving everyone a great day. You know, like the ability to keep the set light and fun and collaborative, even when inevitably every single day something goes disastrously and you lose a bunch of time and everyone's racing and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the atmosphere is a, absolutely a part of it and people's experience and being the kind of leader that helps other departments feel creative and feel like contributors and and feel like they're being heard mm -hmm. and um because they're the experts you know i'm coming i'm like no i'm not gonna know better than you what is the best prop for this moment i can definitely weigh in but like mm -hmm. different people are are experts at their jobs for a reason and there are right. two amazing pieces of advice i got one is from claire scanlon who's a uh, fabulously successful episodic director and she said you know, in TV, your job is to come in and make the show 5% better. 
in your episode. Like you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They don't want you to make the show different than it usually is. But she said also that 5% can be one shot that's really amazing that they don't usually do. It can be that the actor's performances are a little better and more nuanced than usual because that's your strength. She said, or it can just be giving everyone a really good week. And that is true time and again, I think, you know, the reason I get asked back to do episodes again, I think it's happened on every show I've been on. I've now done, been asked back either immediately within the same season or for, you know, subsequent seasons is because, you know, it's equally important to me that everyone has a great time. Like if you are going to do a job that lasts 15 hours a day, it should ideally be enjoyable. And at the end of the yeah. day, like we play pretend for a living. It doesn't need to be a situation where people are screaming and having a miserable, mm -hmm. <laughs> miserable time. Um, the other piece of advice I got is from a director of Paris Barkley, who's also incredible and a legend. And he just, you know, talked to me about, he was like, you know, when I was sort of asking him like, well, I don't know, like, I think I still have so much to learn on the technical side of things and that he was like, listen, I've been doing this for decades and I do know the answer to absolutely everything. And I pretend I don't. And I was Ooh. like, wow. <laughs> um, and he, but it was the greatest piece of advice. He was like, he was like, otherwise people are just executing what you tell, they're just following orders. And that's not what we come here to do. And it's true. Like I show up and I want people to beat my idea. I'm going to get credit for it in the end anyway. Like, it's great. <laughs> yes, please make this better. You know? And right. so, so to that end too, I think part of it, you know, keeping the atmosphere a certain way also goes hand in hand with, you know, making everyone feel really involved and a part of the process mm -hmm. as they, you know, deserve to be. Um, because ultimately the product is better when everyone is feeling happy and collaborative as opposed to like sort of beaten down as it gets on some sets, I think. <laughs> truly, truly. I just think that is such a key piece of advice that setting the energetic tone, not just about knowing what you're doing, knowing what your shots are, knowing who's responsible for what and who to ask, but setting that energetic tone, even when the wheels are coming off, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That is what brings you back because people know that they're in good hands and that yeah. they're not going to have a stressful time, right? Yeah. In, and in good hands is the key. I mean, so often you realize that what people ultimately just want to know is that someone is steering the ship. So it's about mm -hmm. coming in with an airtight plan that it's like, I have an answer for everything, mm -hmm. but I would love for your answer to be even better. And I'll adjust on a dime and incorporate that. And of so course. I think some combination of that is good where like everybody knows that there is, there is a leader there taking care of things, but, mm -hmm. um, but still feels like they can improvise on the day. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Now yeah. you have a background in musical theater that has kind of created a specialty in directing musical elements for shows. Yeah. What challenges arise with those musical scenes? It's interesting. So, uh, and I didn't necessarily foresee when I started doing it that that would be all that unique or, or that it was maybe uh, difficult to do for some directors, mm -hmm. but... Um, it's an interesting balance because I, I, it's not the same as, for instance, like directing a music video, which is just about visuals. Like when you are directing performance, there is a certain balance that has to happen between sort of ways that you can use the camera to get in closer, to create extra movement and to, you know, to sort of like heighten it beyond what it would be just seeing it in a stage setting in a proscenium mm -hmm. way. But by the same token, I think if you go too far in that direction, then you lose the sense of this is still a scene where people are performing for other people. And that also feels a certain way to the, like right. the experience of being in a theater and watching people sing and dance is also a certain thing. And you, you also have to sort of honor what that is like and do your best mm -hmm. to recreate it in an, you know, the magic of theater is that it's live. Right. And so you're doing your best to sort of make it feel as though you got to see it in person, as though you were sitting in the front row and then adding things to heighten emotion where you can. And I think, like, you know, the key is that the camera is an amazing tool in carrying story through uh, a song and dance, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a in a staged setting, you'd have to choreograph it so that wh whoever story it is that's going is still sort of very specifically during the choreography highlighted so that yes, I'm watching all the dancers, but I remember to check in with this person who's having such strong feelings that they need to sing a song. Right. Um, 
the benefit of, of doing it on screen is that you can sort of remind people, you know, you can be in charge of reminding people, this is why we're here, even though the dancing right. is cool. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's funny. I, yeah, I was a choreographer for a long time and a dancer for a long time and didn't at all foresee how that would end up playing into my work as a director. And first I just thought, oh, well, that's why blocking comes naturally to me, even for scene work and like where the cameras go. But once I started shooting musical numbers, I was like, oh, this is the fun is like knowing how to not make it feel static because mm -hmm. then we should just go see a real play. Um, and also how to not sort of lose a little bit of that magic. Of course. And I think I also, in a different conversation about this before, we talked about the understanding and the editing, the musicality of shifting camera oh. and things like that with music. That not everybody has a sense of what that needs to be. I think so. I think having, uh, yeah, having a background, you know, in music and as a singer and stuff also just, it, it does, it gives a, a very specific rhythm to following that story through and, mm -hmm. and yeah, when to change shots and, and how that edit should feel, when it should feel big, when it should feel intimate and all those things, um, which starts, by the way, even before your shoot day, because I, you know, the fun of it for me was that I found out what the scene was going to be. And I like marched right down to the, to the music producer's office. And I was like, okay, can we make the track like this? So that like, yeah, and let's take out the orchestration here. I want this to be like really just about him and da, da, da. And we kind of like created the song in a way to support story. Then I got to work with a choreographer and do the same thing so that there were really built in moments of, of you know, what's for the character versus what's for the spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time you're shooting, you do sort of have all of your elements there and you kind of know what you want to see e in each thing. And then you just get extra surprises in the edit room and get to add those in. It's fun. Of course. Oh, that sounds so fun. <laughs> Could you watch uh, walk us through uh, the process of pitching your ideas on a new show? So, of course, you're in the camp of NBC and Peacock, so they kind of know your portfolio now. But if you were pitching on a new show, a network you hadn't worked for before, how would that go? Interesting. Okay, so, well, this is sort of like a two-part question, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, when I'm when I'm sort sort of interviewing to work on a new show, that is mostly about me showing that I have an understanding of that show. Um, so it's less about having any idea because you know I don't know what my script is going to be yet. There's no details I can offer. Mm -hmm. But from whatever I've gleaned from the pilot, from you know if there is any content, that's always helpful. But a lot of the time I work on shows like you know I'm about to go work on a show that's in season one. Um, you know, when I had my meeting, I only had read the pilot, so I hadn't seen any footage. Right. So you don't, you know, but as best you can sort of dissect and show that you have some understanding of their tone, like what stands out to you about it? What do you think you can particularly service? Like a lot of the time in meetings, I'll talk about the fact that because I started as an actor and because I feel really comfortable working with actors, um, you know, I feel like I have added attention in comedies on not just executing the jokes and making sure they're funny, but also putting those moments of heart underneath and like mm -hmm. really giving actors, you know, flashes of chances to really feel real things mm -hmm. in between all of, all of the fun and games. Um, and, you know, and it can, it, it's just about sort of showing like, I, I see your baby and I know what your baby needs. And so like, I'm the person for that. Then once you arrive for prep, it's a different ball game because now you have a script, now you have specific thoughts about what that might look like. Um, but you also have to stay within certain parameters because, mm -hmm. you know, like like Claire Scanlon said, like you're not there to reinvent what their show is. You're there to help them find new things their show can be. Push mm -hmm. it out of shape just in certain ways in different directions. And so during that week, you know, I'll I'll spend a lot of time coming up with ideas I think work nicely if there's like a way I want to shoot something that is outside of what they what their like basic camera language is on the show, I will run that by the showrunner ahead of time. If I'm like, I think we could do this whole section as a one -er, and here's how we would like show the passage of time and whatever. I'll bring that up ahead of time because you, that's not something you have like so much backup for on the day. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, if I just have ideas about specific pieces and little specialty shots and things 
if they don't require any equipment that's outside of the norm that you have to plan for in advance, I just sort of say to the DP at the beginning of each scene, like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some things and then you tell me when I've broken the show. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm always like, I'm going to try to push this to be more creative, more exciting, something new. Mm -hmm. But the second that I've broken what this show is, like, you just tell me I'm not going to be precious about it and we'll, we'll switch it up, you know? And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I really lean on the DP, especially, and of course the showrunner to, um, make sure they've heard all my craziest ideas. Um, and also PS, your AD is the best sounding board for that. Cause you're like hanging out all week. And so I'm always like, um, okay, I'm just going to make you sit here and listen to crazy things. And then you tell me if you like it. And you know, your AD is so experienced and has seen it all and, mm -hmm. you know, has a director's eye and all that stuff. And so, um, that's a great sounding board too. And so, you know, I just sort of like throw everything out there, but, but I'm totally okay to, take the wins and also, you know, if it's, if it doesn't work for what this show is, that's fine. Of course, keeping it in the parameters of, of the world, right? Breaking the mm -hmm. show is stepping outside of telling the audience we're breaking a rule, right? We've, n we've never done a close up on this show, but now yeah. all of a sudden we are, whoops. Something that would just feel jarring to the audience, yep. right? I mean, there are things that feel new and would make someone lean forward. And then there are things that might feel like, what? if, <laughs> if yeah, you were watching and, you lo and this was a show that you loved and so, you know, keeping, uh, keeping away from that. And like, you know, the DP is there day in and day out and, and will be there for all episodes going forward. And so that person really is the, the person who holds the look of the show. Mm -hmm. um, the, the gatekeeper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just, you know, I go in with a sense of play about it and I share my ideas, you know, and get excited about them and also am always offering them as like a starting point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and something that could be, you know, something that we hopefully can then all collaborate on to find what works best in this context. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Could you just kind of lightly walk us through the events in terms of from getting your script to, to post, what meetings are you having? Who do you need to make mm -hmm. sure you're talking to? Can you just walk us through that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, usually, you know, if it's, if all is going well, you get your script a few days before you start prep, um, maybe a day before you start prep. And, uh, I immediately just start reading the script over and over and over and over and over, um, because I need to get all those details and the, you know, you just need to like digest and digest and redigest all the, all of the stuff that's in there. When you get to prep, usually, um, you know, typically it starts with a director's scout, which is really just you kind of going ahead to some of the locations so that you can get a sense of them, how they might work. You talk to the production designer while you're there about how, you know, how he or she is planning to set it up, um, how, you know, what might be helpful for you, what you're thinking in terms of the blocking. So you sort of like get your location stuff down. Maybe you take a tour. If you shoot on stages, you can take a tour of of some of the sets that are standing. Um, early in the week, there are meetings. There's a concept meeting with every department where, you know, everyone is on there and you sort of go, you know, scene by scene through the entire script. And you say, okay, for this scene, we're gonna need, you know, he needs to have a backpack. Should that look like his regular backpack or is that special because he's on a mission today? Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. You know, you sort of like go through all the details of that. And it's sort of loose pitching to get the ball rolling on things. So you can say, I don't know, I was picturing kind of a mission backpack, but I don't, I don't know what that is. Or maybe we could see some ideas. And, you know, that's just getting things in motion for meetings you're going to have later in the week. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the week goes on, you get more specific, more detailed meetings with a production designer, with props, with wardrobe, with hair and makeup, if there's any specialty stuff, with stunts. Um, just to set those things up toward the end of the week, you have a production meeting, which is the way more detailed, more concrete version of the concept meeting. So now all yeah. the departments are back and you go through step by step by step by step. And these are like final decisions. This is what we're using and any mm. final red flags. That's your chance to like fix those things, um, down to like, you know, how many of this food prop should we have? How do you think you're going to shoot it? Are you going to need 20 to do that many takes or do you need like eight right mm -hmm. um how many extras how many bodies do we have on set Whatever. everything yeah. yeah yeah 
And so, and just all the details of how the schedule is gonna work and why and all those things. Um, and then uh, you also have toward the end of the week, uh, a tech scout, which is going back to the locations, but now again with many more departments. So the production designer is there in the AD, but also the riggers and you know everyone who's gonna sort of have to plan not just what does the space look like, but then based on how you're gonna shoot it, where can I park the trucks and where can I, you know, you have to like figure out the whole footprint mm -hmm. of what that shoot day is gonna be. Um, and so you do the walkthrough for the tech scout. And then the final thing that is arguably one of your, your most important meeting of the week is the tone meeting, which um, is really just you and the showrunner and the AD, maybe some producers, and you're talking through line by line, word by word. What is anything in the script that might, you know, that that you have questions about? It's your chance to ask every final question so that mm -hmm. you're not you're not like, oh, is this what he means by this on the day? Like that's that's right. not a good look. So the goal is that and um and and the tone meeting is also like just a good place to get intel because you know, especially if your show's been going for a little while, mm -hmm. um the showrunner has insights on how different actors like to work or, you know, things, you know, just some of the dynamics on set too. Um, so that's sort of where you arm yourself with everything you're going to need going in because directing is like, I think 90% being a psychologist and 10% uh -huh. being an actual artist. <laughs> um, and then it, for that same reason, because you're just meeting, you know, 150 new people that you're supposed to, and you're supposed to gain their trust in, you know, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what happens. And then, uh, and then of course you have your shoot week, which if you do, I do, you know, half hour episodic. And so it's like four days of prep, five days of shooting. Uh, and then at the end of that, uh, you know, there's a little break while an editor puts together a first pass for you. And then uh, you have two director days to edit your episode. And so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do that as a combination sometimes of like watch the first pass, have a bunch of notes ready. Um, and then just, you know, go through these days over Zoom, um, you know, moment for moment and tweak, tweak, tweak for, for two days. And then it's, then it's off into the world and someone else's baby. And then the showrunner gets to, to fix it however they want. Um, and then you do it all again. <laughs> wow. And it happens so swiftly. Like, I don't think people know yeah. that the turnaround is that quick but also that you can set yourself up as you're directing, like even as you're reading, you're pre-editing it, this tracks to that in your head a bit, aren't you? That like you're setting yourself up ideally and optimally yes. to have just those two days in the edit. You will have yeah. surprises no matter what on the day. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like you don't want those surprises to be from yourself. And so <laughs> like, I would like those surprises to be blamed on other things. And so, um, so to that end, yeah, I mean, from the first time I'm even reading through, I'm thinking not just about what lines need to feel closer up or is this does this play funnier in a two with these two characters side by side? You know, like a lot of how the dialogue works is depends on how I block it to make sure we have to we can like be as efficient as possible with our coverage. Right. Right. Um, you know, tons of movement is lovely, but like it's not a film when we don't have two days to shoot this scene. And right. so like, you know, you have to sort of be smart about where the cameras are and keeping people in. The, and then, um, you know, but also from go, I'm thinking about transitions between scenes. What's my first shot of this scene? What's my last shot of that scene? How does that final shot connect in the funniest way to the first shot of the next scene? Mm -hmm. And like, where can I add jokes? visually like where can i not just support you know where can i support the comedy with the camera and where can i add comedy with the camera and so that you're really like you know mining it for every possible thing you can find mm. you are also a creator and performer what do you think are the keys to wearing multiple hats well on original <laughs> content <laughs> well being the operative word because we've all mm. done it we've all tried it various levels of success yeah How do you do it well uh, well, there is an absolute guarantee for myself, at least, that any day that I am wearing multiple hats on set, I will think I'm doing a garbage job at all of them because okay. you just, you know, you are just switching your attention back and forth. So, like, 
when I'm directing and also acting in something, I spend the whole day being like, I'm probably the worst actor on earth. I don't, I don't even know what I'm doing. I can't, I can't even tell them. So, you know, and so it never feels great because I think it's just, you know, it's a very different feeling from mm. showing up and just like, it doesn't feel like flow, right? right. Which is, right. you know, the optimum goal for how a, a successful workday should feel emotionally, right? Mm. So you're like not getting flow out of it, but um, there is something amazing about being able to get each thing exactly as what was in your head and know that that stuff. But the secret weapon 100% is other people, right? I, I mean, I'm a huge believer that the whole point of doing this insane marathon career is to gather humans, right? Like yeah. you do projects, some of the projects are like, whew, that was a terrible film, but you were awesome. Come with me. And right. And then yeah. you're like, do the next thing. And you're like, nah, I wouldn't do that again. But like you and you, I would like you. you. And then you sort of gather over time a, a core group of collaborators who understand your aesthetic, are lovely to work with, you know, mm -hmm. support you and just get what you're going for. Like they can get inside your brain easily. Right. right. And the more you work together, the easier that is to do, <clears throat> excuse me. And so when that, when you get that kind of a cabal of people, then you, then it begin, becomes so easy on those days. And like, I just lean on those people. Mm -hmm. And if it's happening, I get to the end of a take and I'm like, you know, and I, you're sort of half out and half in because you can't watch yourself and be fully in the moment at the same time. Right. And so I will just turn to, to those people that I trust and I will be like, I don't feel like that was, I think we need to do it again because I really want it to seem like this, like this is the thing I'm going for. Mm -hmm. And if they say to me, I know what you mean and it is actually in there, like that is coming across or whatever, then, mm -hmm. then it's on me to say, okay, listen, I picked these people for a reason. I believe in them. So if they tell me that and they, I like, I believe they get what I mean and, and trust it. And then you get to the edit and you're like, oh yeah, good job. Yeah. Yeah. I, we didn't need to do six takes. It was fine on the third one, yeah. but like, yep. you know, so it's sort of as like taking those insecurities and then like just building out your support system all around you as much as you can. And that's the glory of making your own stuff is that you get to choose all those people mm -hmm. and you and can you really, know. yeah, everyone can have good group think in those. Moments. Of course. Of course. Well, it's that shorthand of like, I need it mm -hmm. to be this and this. Can you deal with that? Will I deal with this? And they're like, mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. it. That, yep. that yep. is a thing of beauty and it's mastery level in your creativity where you just get. And it takes, yeah, it takes a long around. time to find those people. But when you do, you really have to like handcuff them to yourself and never let them go. Because yes. <laughs> yes. So true. You're like, make them, make them sign. Like, uh -huh. please belong uh -huh. to me. Please yes. belong to me. And with some sort of blood packed. And yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> yes. Well, you worked with several of them on your improvised feature, The Thing Before the Thing, which you brought to Catalyst in 2020, which yeah. was, of course, during the pandemic. <laughs> yep. And amidst, you know, a little bit of chaos. But what do you think? How are festivals and communities like ours important for creators? Why no. do we do this? What oh, my are God. are getting from it? I have the, I'm so glad you're asking me this today because only in the last like six to eight months have I gotten a great answer to this that I didn't have before. Um, I, with the thing before the thing with have it all, which was a short film I made. Um, I had like a few years in a row where I was just on the festival train back to back going to a million festivals and it was really fun. And I loved it and it was successful for the films and it, you know, contributed certainly to like other work I was getting. But I, I got to the end of it probably about a year ago now. And I just was like, oof, that was, I mean, festivals are a big investment mm -hmm. of money, of time. If you want to attend them, you have to pay to travel then you're there and then you have to like go to all the mixers and the doodads and whatever and it's like it's such a to-do right and it's fun but it is also you know you get to the end of it and you're like what you know what what was that all about was was that totally worth it whatever and I had a like a little moment where I was like you know I don't know like the, it's it's so much and you ultimately end up meeting a lot of people who are at your same level right I met like a million wonderful filmmakers who I love who are all trying to do the same thing I am. It's not like the head of Warner Brothers is there like, oh my God, your five minute short film is changing my life. Now here's this big movie, right? So 
that was, you know, I had a sort of moment of doubt, like, okay, I mean, I made some great friends, but like, did this move me forward at all? And then last fall, um, just a wonderfully talented filmmaker who's um, uh, who's making his first feature very soon, and I'm so excited about it. Um, I had met at a couple of festivals. We had shorts that were playing in the same block uh, at LA Shorts and then some other festival that was a couple of months later. So we kind of re-ran into each other and just were kind of Facebook friends and had met a few times. Um, and he uh, found out about a feature that this like production financing company was putting together. And when someone told him about the movie, he said, oh, you need to find Katie O'Brien. She needs to direct that movie. And so he texted me out of the blue. He's like, is it okay if I put your name in for this thing? I was kind of thinking nothing of it. I was like, yeah, sure, thank you, whatever. Um, and then they got in touch with me and it's like the perfect, feature for me to direct and it's totally legit and it's gonna have a giant budget and we're like casting real people now. So yeah, I pitched on it and I and I got attached to it because it is the story I should be telling. And, you know, maybe no one would have known that other way. And, and you know, I had, I've done that for other filmmakers that I met during that thing too, but I sort of wasn't, wasn't putting enough value on that. Mm -hmm. um, and now this like huge new part of my career is happening because Nardeep is awesome and thought of me. And so, um, you know, I think absolutely it's one of the, like the glory of festivals is it's great because the communities do really support each other and you do get to meet so many amazing people during it. And then it is mm -hmm. kind of like a, you know, rise with the tide kind of thing. And like, you know, you help each other out and it, it does actually last well beyond just just the time that you're sitting there watching the block of films. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you know, same thing, Catalyst has been so wonderful and you get, there are so many good resources and like, you know, that was a year ago now and it's been a presence in my life ever since. And so, you know, there is, there's so much learning that can happen. There's so much, you know, support that can happen. And the networking actually does lead to wonderful things. You just have to be patient, you know, and it's, it's you, even if the payoff doesn't come right away, even if your short film doesn't immediately get like bought and put on HBO Max or whatever right. you were hoping was gonna happen, like without fail, it always pays off in some weird way down the road. <laughs> Absolutely, you have yeah. to, creators have to take themselves out of that transactional mindset mm -hmm. that I'm coming here with a thing, what kind of ribbon are you putting on it? What do I get? What do yes. I get from this that's that matches transactionally as opposed mm -hmm. to what seeds am I planting mm -hmm. with the networking that I'm doing to yeah. take this community forward with me and for us to help each other and for kind of everybody to win and to grow together? I think that's 100% right. That it's about yeah. the networking and the planting seeds and the relationships over time rather than a transactional this for that. Uh, I bring this project. I get that prize. I get that, that level up. It does take time. And it's a weird, it's a, it's a weird vibe already sometimes because festivals are often set up in a way that is meant to feel competitive, right? They're, mm -hmm. you know, they give awards for the best film and whatever, when, you know, tons of great films are at a lot of these festivals and it's, it's apples and oranges to even try to compare them. So fine. Um, but it is, it's sort of set up in this weird way. And yet I find at every festival I attend, there's this sort of transcendence that happens and the creators are actually there to meet each other and to support each other. And, and most of it just becomes about befriending those other people. Mm -hmm. um, but it did, but you know, but yeah, it's true. Like I got to the end of that road and I was like, Ooh, when you put all of the money I spent on festivals <laughs> in one sum, ugh, that was kind of a lot. Like what did that, mm -hmm. you know? And then sure enough, like two weeks later that happened. And so it really is just, I had a, acting teacher who um, always said like, every move that you make for your career, every move you make to get your art out there is money in the bank. You just don't know when you're gonna withdraw it. You, like you don't know when you're gonna cash mm -hmm. out, right? And so mm -hmm. you have to just always trust that making those moves, meeting more artists, sharing with them what you do and how you see the world is always valuable, right? And then you just, you can't possibly predict when that's gonna pay off. And it, that has proven to be true for me over and over and over again. 
I love that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing all of these insights. Everybody should know that The Thing Before The Thing, which is what you brought, the mm -hmm. feature that you brought to Catalyst, is now on Amazon, correct? Woo yes. Woohoo, woohoo. Amazon and other places too? Uh, oh, maybe That's to be, but uh, Amazon is the important one. Yes, yes, yes. Got it, got it. <laughs> awesome. I was like, oh, wait, am I leaving something out? Like, wait, yeah. Oh, God. No, I think, <laughs> and, I think uh, it might be on TV as well, but. Of course. And as you watch <laughs> Ghosts on CBS in the fall, do watch for Katie in the credits. Thank Four you. Four for episodes, yeah. Four episodes. That's incredible. Very thank exciting. You, thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us. And for uh, we sure. wish you luck with all of the, all of the above. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs>